The inventor of DDT won a Nobel Prize. In 1945, it was available for civilian use. Uh, it was the strongest pe pesticide the world had ever known. Developed in 1939, DDT was lauded for clearing the South Pacific Islands of malaria-causing insects threatening the survival of U.S. troops in, in World War II. Rachel Carson's Silent Spring was, was a landmark book of the 20th century, tackling the issues of DDT. Her research proved, rather than saving humanity from disease and pests, it entered the food chain via a network of pathways resulting in enormous loss of animal life and affecting humans with cancer and genetic damage. Presented as literature rather than scientific report, her work caught the attention of the public and President John F. Kennedy, resulting in galvanizing the vulnerability of, of nature to human intervention and resulting in the environmental movement. Systems theory posits that everything is interconnected and, and, and interrelated, and legacies such as DDT work their way into our systems and affect stories that are still long from over. For example, my father was drafted and served in the United States Army in the South Pacific Theater in World War II. Trained and skilled in jiu-jitsu martial arts, he experienced three major invasions over four years, including the Battle of Okinawa, referred to as the Typhoon of Steel. Prior to leaving for the war, he had been building his own grain farm in North Dakota. When he was drafted, he sold his farm to his dad for a dollar with the handshake agreement that should he return, he would buy it back. He did return, immediately married my mom, and together they continued to build a 1,500-acre grain farm. My parents were natural systems farmers before it was fashionable to be so. The land was located across from a national wildlife refuge close to the Canadian border. Dominated by a 360-degree line where the air meets the sky. Do you see the sign? It says air. Uh, the late Joan Rivers described that landscape as being so flat you could see your relatives coming six months out. <laughs> Situated in the middle of the Bakken Formation with estimates as high as 18 billion barrels of recoverable oil production, the land is rich and black both above and below that line. Life as a farmer depended on the ability to read that sky, the wind, the wildlife, the landscape. Twenty years ago, when I came to Penn State, I shareboarded with the stables that hosted the Penn State equestrian team. One fall, we had a very hard, very early frost, and I asked the stable owner if the horses had time to build up their hide. He said the smart ones did. 1,500 acres is a large farm even in those parts, but it wasn't all in production at one time. One third would be in diverse crops, another third was planted in alfalfa, and another third was summer followed turn that alfalfa into the soil, restoring the nitrogen and eliminating the need for chemical fertilizers. We ate from our own garden, our livestock, our spring-fed well. Neighbors met after church over strong coffee to organize labor and equipment sharing. And faith wasn't an option. You could have a golden crop one, gold, one morning, uh, late morning, for, ready for harvest, and that crop could be destroyed that afternoon in a 10-minute hailstorm. Um, faith wasn't, wasn't an option in, in that case. Um, Scandinavians aren't typically known for drama, or talking for that matter. <laughs> Add to that, parents who had lived through the Depression, survived World War II, and were now raising a family in the 50s, nothing was wasted and nothing was wrong. It was a license to be fearless. Therefore, for me, Design solved serious problems, and architecture had an aesthetic that originated from the realm of everyday life, in which people create and negotiate their own sense of things, how they learn about the world, how they find meaning or build their own theology, and how they manage the resources they come to love and depend upon. My early days as an architect saw interest rates as high as 18, 19 percent. That meant money was expensive, and it biased those who could afford to build hospitals, universities, uh, government. Absent was the kind of sensibility or rootedness that emerges from design detached from a patron. And I wondered who was looking at how undis uh, undis or destructive and unsustainable 
human systems could be? Or what about the characteristics of human systems when they're glorious? I developed a graduate seminar identifying systems approaches to commons environments, institutions, and human behavior um, associated with collective decision-making within community. Commons are typically associated with the tragedy of the commons parable. It holds that any shared resource invariably gets overexploited as a result of self-interest. After Hardin's famous essay of 1968, commons topics have been identified in every discipline in an attempt to find better approaches to uh, more effectively sharing shared resources. Eleanor Ostrom was a, a social scientist, and she won a Nobel Prize in economics in 2009. Her work presented a case for grassroots approaches to institutional design impacting the commons. Eleanor passed away in 2012. My colleagues tell me Dr. Ostrom would be quite pleased with the work an architect is doing to extend and expand her work. Commons and systems are packaged within community. They come with values, rules for operating, and a worldview. And they're not limited to natural systems. We see them in open source software, social media, and an array of shared social communities online. As a result of thinking of architectures this way, we've been invited to address or approach design solutions for, for problems exhibiting systems-wide failures. Water seeks its own level is a classic reference to systems thinking. For most of us, design is invisible until it fails. In fact, the secret desire of design would be to become invisible, to be absorbed into the, the culture or taken into the background. Apple, for example, is a company that has done more to integrate design into our everyday life than any Starchitect out there. They did that by targeting a technology like the telephone, but then designing it for more than communication, but for every aspect of our lives involving interaction, including how we navigate with media. One problem that we were asked to explore was recovery efforts after a natural or unnatural disaster. First responders are the emergency, fire, police, um, uh, and medical on, a, on the scene in an emergency. Compounding the efforts of the first responders are the worried well, roughly 70% of those who otherwise jam up communication, transportation, and, and, um, and emergency situ systems when emergency personnel try to move into action. Still another kind of pandemic results from um, people who uncoordinated information. Unfortunately, the public has come to expect the media to profit from shock value in these times of emergency and relief. Therefore, a system that might otherwise go be ubiquitous, accessible, and affordable goes underutilized during these times of emergency and relief. We designed the deployable message, a network communication system designed to override credible sources like the newspaper or news magazines to desensationalize information during these times. And like the Amber Alert or the emergency broadcast system, this system would be presented in uniquely. In this case, if you see Time magazine or Newsweek magazine printed in hot pink, you know that it's only the truth and it's free. The earthquake that struck Haiti, and after the, the failing of the emergency camps in Corail, we expanded our systems response infrastructure to what we called the Virtual Town Center. Our innovation won us first prize in an I am a second responder competition. Our approach acknowledged that temporary camps become permanent settlements. Lives are uprooted and displaced. Starting over may also mean not being able to go back. We harness cell phone technology and social media to rally worldwide second responders to come and assist in the planning or the design and for innovating uh, water purification, sanitation, closed loop systems in, in order to allow us to rebuild well. The know-how is there, the resources are there, and the systems are simple. 
I find it remarkable that Detroit was able to retool and retrain from building automobiles to building war um, in three years. So from 1942 to 1945 in World War II, no one could buy a new car. And if a social, uh, cultural critic and comedian, John Oliver, can ignite a social media like Reddit to save net neutrality, do not un underestimate the power of groundswell and grassroots approaches to do amazing things. The idea of mobilizing a virtual town center and global know-how was reinforced after the earthquake and tsunami that collapsed the northeast shoreline of uh, Honshu, Japan. Friends and family on the inside called on the virtual community on the outside to rally and help to orchestrate relief from points around the world. All of these and, and others have helped shape a technology we are building called Mango. Mango is a perfect symbol for this technology. In many cult cultures around the world, every part of the mango is used, consumed, or revered. For us, it represents a Craigslist for NGOs, aligning local needs and global know-how. There are 1.8 million NGOs operating worldwide, and over 6 million individuals working in the nonprofit sector. Yet, inefficiency, misappropriation of funds, mismanagement, are unfortunate operational norms. One of our team members worked for a community in Peru, and he saw clothing donations come to Chilca from North America, but the clothes were too large for the physically smaller Peruvians. They needed small shoes for small feet. This is unacceptable. Mango, currently in development and testing, hopes to roll out sometime this spring. It leverages sophisticated modeling software used in architecture for scenario building of, for example, facade studies, or to optimize views, or to coordinate materials and construction logistics in complex building projects around the world. And it adapts that technology to grassroots efforts at self-building and, and local time. If our concept of social justice is founded on the framework of the public as a shared interest, then at-risk commons are a reflection of the failing of that framework. We need a reimagined, integrated ecosystem, including governance, production, economics, and culture. And if we think that worldview is out of sync with our current reductive processes of reason and logic, I say we see them working very well in the social practices of participation, inclusiveness, fairness, bottom-up, community-based innovation, and accountability. And we need to honor the role of life and metabolism that allows us to build uh, meaning, beauty, and relevance in our models for policy reform. Recently, I asked my grad students to dust off the kinds of questions they asked when they were five-year-old children. Questions such as, so why can't cars fly? My favorite question of this sort is in the movie Matilda, where Danny DeVito plays Mr. Wormwood, Matilda's father, takes Matilda and her brother to his car dealership to show them the tricks to selling cars. Matilda is horrified to see her dad is passing off bad cars to innocent customers. She asks, don't people need good cars, dad? Can't we sell good cars? I think an adult version of Matilda's challenge might look like this. I'll give you some time to read it. We might all be in there somewhere. When my oldest son was in grade school, I was invited to come speak on their medieval architecture module. I brought along these two toys to denote the difference between medieval Big M, which is a sort of branded style of castles, knights, jousting, and medieval Little M to denote craft, care, one of a kind, or something that grows out of extraction out of a local life. A week later, I got a bundle of thank you notes from the children, and one in particular pretty much nailed it and took away my thunder. 
Thank you for showing us little A's, what you big A's do. <laughs> Thank you.